Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Today uh, we'll speak about uh, trauma. I'm going to lecture for two, two lectures. One about physical anterior segment trauma. And chemical anterior segment trauma will be, inshallah, in the next week. طبعا ال 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 الفيزيكال انتيريو سيجمنت تروما احنا تكلمنا عن ال اللي هو ال الانديكيشن الريسك فاكتورز الابديميولوجي في البيسك ساينس كورس سو يو كان جو تو ذات كلينيك تو ذات ليكشر اند يو كان جيت ات ريجاردينج ذا ذا انتيريو سيجمنت تروما مانجمنت ويل سبيك توداي اباوت ذا مانجمنت مينلي سو ان ذس Lecture will divide it in blunt trauma and open eye uh, injury. So blunt trauma, as let us start with hyphema. Hyphema, as you know, we grade hyphema to micro hyphema, one, two, three, four, according to the level of the bleeding in the anterior chamber. In this table, we are correlating between the grade of hyphema and the visual prognosis. So if you see here, micro hyphema and grade one, grade one which is almost th third of the anterior chamber, these patients, they get more than 90% uh, 2050 fission or bitter. Grade two, which is almost half uh, hyphema, 50% to anterior chamber, they got 70% 2050 or, or bitter. Like, but see these, these people who got three, grade three and grade four, or what we call total hyphema or eight ball hyphema. These people, they get 50% only uh, improvement to 2050 or more. So the grading um, uh, yani t tells you about the, the uh, visual prognosis. Where is the source of bleeding? Usually the iris, ciliary body, or trabecular meshwork. So the source of bleeding, the bleeding will come from the iris, from ciliary body, from trabecular meshwork. Always in these cases, blunt injury, you have to rule out uh, rupture injury, rupture globe. Dilated fundus exam is, is very mandatory because it is, there is a lot of uh, retinal injuries in such cases. Um, usually, hyphema usually resolved spontaneously. But there is some cases which needs really admission and extra care. Patients who are the children, non-compliant patients, and patients who are at a greater risk of visual loss, like sickle cell disease, sickle cell trait, uncontrolled intraocular pressure, patients who have more than 50% hyphema, or patients presented with recurrent bleeding. These cases at high risk of visual loss and complications. So you might admit such cases. How we manage? We manage by bed rest, limited activity. Usually we elevate the, the uh, bed 30 degrees, um, eye shield to protect the eye, and atropine, what, why not cyclo? Iman, why not cyclo? Another Iman. Why not cyclo? What night? What? Um, yes. Uh huh. Uh huh. Mazen. Movement. Yeah. In such patient, you want to almost paralyze the, the, the pupil and fixed dilated, not to have a movement which might introduce or provoke a bleeding. So atropine is the best choice, best choice for patients who have hyphema. You should avoid these medications, non-steroidal, uh, because these can increase the risk of bleeding. You have to control the, the uh, IOB, diamox, is the drug of choice except in seclers because it will increase the acidity of the blood and will induce precipitate uh, a sickling attack okay also you can use um, 
drugs which is like methazolamide which is a medication which is an AC uh, in inhibitor but has no effect on on seclers. Topical steroid usually prescribed because these patients they have associated uveitis. Rebleeding usually occur in 30 to 50 percent of of cases. The uh, most rebleeds associated with poor prognosis. Why? Because these cases, they have usually larger hyphema than the initial one. Usually they have secondary glaucoma associated, and usually they might precipitate uh, or go to a corneal blood staining. Surgical evacuation, there is an indication for the surgical intervention. You intervene if there is suspicion of corneal blood staining, especially in, in children, if there is an eight ball hyphema for seven days, or if there is high intraocular pressure. These are the three main indications for evacuation. In non seclers, 50 uh, pressure for five days or 35. Uh, uh, pressure for seven days is an indication and then secular. However, in seclers, just 25 pressure in one to two days is enough to go for uh, evacuation. I'll show you this uh, video. I hope it will work. Yeah. This, this is a procedure of surgical evacuation. This is, by the way, Can we lower the, the voice? This is an eight pole hyphema. This is a blood and this is a clot. The procedure is to open a bar small paracentesis. You see the blood started to go out from the anterior chamber. Then you wash the anterior chamber, but I want you to have look to the, to the pupil after the, the wash. See the blood coming from back. See the blood? So if you want to wash, you have to keep the anterior chamber under tamponade always. So what they did here, they evacuate the pressure. They evacuate the blood, sorry. And they put an anterior chamber maintenance to keep the anterior chamber under pressure all the time. Okay? And then removal of the clot. And see what he did, fill the anterior chamber with, with air, okay, and then remove the uh, AC maintainer to keep the pressure and to avoid a re-bleeding again, okay. So this is the way how to evacuate um, total uh, hyphema. Once hyphema resolve, this patient should avoid any exercise for at least two months because bleeding, re-bleeding can occur. You should follow these patients with gonioscopy for the whole year, for the whole life, checking the pressure because of this risk. Angle recession, which can occur years after this trauma. Antifibrolytic medication is used by some centers um, they can, give in, uh, can be given uh, IV or an ophthalmic gel. What is the idea of this medication? They delay the absorption of the blood clot. Okay. 
So this will avoid re-bleeding. Two medications are used, amino carboric acid and transdexamic acid. I, in, in our in university, they are not using it. I don't know in, in, in Kekish, uh, anybody using it, uh, Dr. Misfer? Yeah. Ah. Yeah, but it's... It, anybody using it in Kekish? Uh, as far as I remember, it's very rarely it's, it's used. Okay, now we go for uh, open trauma. And open trauma, I want to give you some beers about corneal suturing. It's very important when you repair an, an open eye to know some of the tricks in, in, in corneal suturing. Uh, the effects, what we call tissue compression, okay? Tissue compression, what we mean here is that when you put a suture, okay, the depth of the suture should be ideal. What is the ideal depth of the suture? To give the best alignment, 100%, through and through. Through and through, it will give you the perfect alignment. But the risk of infection and leak is, is high. So 90% will work similar to 100%. So what we do usually is 90%, which give you the same almost same alignment as a uh, through and through um, suture. But see what, what you do when, when you do just a shallow uh, stitch. This is maybe 50% or less. You will have an internal gap in the wound, which is, which is a bad um, alignment. Okay. The other concept of, of uh, of suture compression, that always, if this is the incision, this is the suture, always the zone of compression, the lateral zone of compression, is equal to the length of the suture. So if you see, it's a diamond, okay? So if this is half, it's almost equal to this distance. You should always keep in mind, when you put a stitch, that the lateral, lateral zone of compression is equal to the length of the, of the suture. This is important for, for uh, example, this one. See this wound and this wound. You see the length? Here you need multiple short sutures to get the same lateral compression. Here one suture may be enough for this because this is very long and this is, often. Uh, this, uh, we are speaking of something else. This, this suture, it's give you the, the maximum compression just underneath the stitch. And when you go laterally, the force of compression will be less and less and less. For example here, you see the, the lateral compression. If you keep this one closer to this, then you will not have an area of gap. For, he, for example here, this wound and this wound and this wound. See how many stitch we need here. How many stitch we need here. How many stitch we need here for the same length of, of suture, of the wound. Here, because it is short, you need multiple stitch to keep the area of compression overlapping. If you want to put it longer suture, you need less sutures. Okay, so this is what we mean by uh, tissue compression. Here, if you want to do a, a stitch for a wound like this, okay, you need to have long sutures in the periphery and short sutures in the center because what we mean about the lateral compression area. Here, why we put small sutures or short sutures to avoid the visual axis. So it will have a less stigmatism in the, in the visual axis. For example, see this wound. This is a regular wound, okay? Of course, always we have to put the stitch just perpendicular to, to the wound. 
So if you put it here, this is perpendicular, this is perpendicular, this is perpendicular in the other way. So this will create what? A distortion of tissue. Okay? And this is the result. So this is what we mean by tissue compression, the zone of tissue compression. Okay, so if we want to suture a wound like this, okay, what is the effect if you put a stitch? The stitch will flatten the area just underneath the suture, but it will steepen the central part in the same meridian of the suture. Okay. For example, when you have a, a wound like this from the cornea, from limbus to limbus, how will you uh, suture this wound? When you suture such a wound, you start with the landmark, which is the limbus, the limbus, and put one stitch or two stitch here and here. This will flatten the cornea and the periphery. And then you can put a small stitches, okay, in the center to keep the contour of the, of the cornea. Why small stitches here? To avoid less distortion, to avoid the visual axis and to avoid the astigmatism. Then we go to another concept, which what we call tissue torquing. What what we mean by torquing? In Arabic, iltiwa, iltiwa, the wound. So here is this a radial stitch? No, radial stitch should come like this, right? This one, this stitch is not radial, so. The effect of this stitch will have what? Will have turquing of the tissue. And then we'll have leak from, from the wound. So always the stitch should be perpendicular to the, to the wound. This is very important. Another issue is tissue inversion and tissue eversion. What we mean by this? If you have a single stitch, it has usually, this is a single stitch, it's not continuous stitch, okay? It has equal inversion and eversion of the tissue in the same meridian. However, if you have continuous or running stitch, then this stitch will depress the tissue in that area, and here there is another stitch will bulge the tissue up. So you'll have the tissue is wavy and in running sutures. What we mean by tissue or wound override? Okay. Here, this is the, this wound. This is a wound which is uh, vertical. If you take same distance from here to here, you will have a perfect alignment this is the result so if you have a stitch which is uh, sorry a wound which is vertical and you take same distance then you will have a perfect alignment however if you take an equal distance between the from the wound then you might have an override in one area what about a shelf wound if you have shelf wound, the equal distance should be from the back, not from the uh, front wound margin. So if you, if you take, take it from here, then you will have this result, which is an override. But if you respect the wound from, from the back and you take equal distance respecting this point, then you will have a perfect alignment and you will avoid an override. So in shelf wound, respect the posterior wound, posterior entry, by taking this distance, which is equal from here to here, equal in half to the posterior level. Tissue splinting. What we mean by tissue splint? It's same as splint. If you have a stitch here, and this is 90 degree, 
then this tissue is perfectly aligned. However, if this is nine, not 90 degree, then you will have tissue which is not perfectly uh, aligned. Okay. Now let us go for corneal and corneal laceration. What is the aim of repair? Why we do repair for corneal or corneal laceration? The aim, complete watertight closure. This is number one. Number two, we want to restore the corneal sphericity. We want to re release and, replay, uh, and uh, release the uvial and uh, vitreous incarceration. We want to prevent and manage infections and we need to prepare for secondary and tear segment reconstructive surgery if needed the most fundamental thing in, in, in such cases if you cannot do it don't do it send it to someone who is expert in doing uh, such uh, trauma cases The wound might be partial thickness or full thickness. What can we do with partial thickness wound? For, for these cases, you have to examine very well with sit lamp the dismet membrane. There is no disruption of dismet membrane, no break. And you can use sidle test with provocative test. You can just squeeze the eye gently and see if there is any leak and make sure that there is no uh, opening. What is the treatment of goal? Treatment goal here in such case. Here we need to promote epithelial healing, we need the stromal healing, and we want to prevent infection. How to manage? This is a partial thickness wound. You can use bandage contact lens, pressure patch, or sometimes stitches. What about simple full thickness Laceration. These cases, usually they does not violate limbus. There is no iris or vitreous incarceration, no trauma or damage to the lens. That's why we name this type of wounds as simple full thickness laceration. What can we do here? As you can see, there is different type which is we have the vertical wound and we have the shelf wound. Usually, the vertical wound, it gaps more. Shelf wound, as you know, it can close spontaneously. So these lacerations, you might leave it and don't suture it in, in such uh, cases. If you have a small, very small wound, one or two or three millimeter laceration, very small, there is no intraocular tissue in the wound. Okay? There is no iris, no vitreous, no foreign body in, in the wound. Self-sealed. In a cooperative patient, such cases you can just observe. You don't need to take them to the, to the OR. How to manage them? You can just put a bandage contact lens or you can use a glue with, with eye shield and observe the patient for healing and if there is any signs of infection. What about satellite lacerations? These are more difficult to, to manage. Such a patient, you know, this is, this is the wound and there is another branching wound. This is what we mean by satellite legion, which needs multiple interrupted sutures. Sometimes you need a bridge suture or bare string suture with bandage contact lens or glue or even batch graft. This is an example. You see this is the cross sutures. Bare string, you can use glue. You can use a tectonic small graft to close such a, a uh, wound. What about cornea clear laceration with uveal prolapse or iris incarceration? These are more complicated cases. These cases, you have to make sure that the, the, the iris is viable, not necrotic. So look to, to the iris. Is it 24 hours outside the eye? Is it devitalized, macerated? 
these cases you have to excise the eyes or the tissue out to prevent the risk of infection or epithelial ingrowth. This is an example of uh, cone scleral laceration with uveal uh, prolapse. So any laceration extending beyond the limbus require a meticulous exploration. This is very important. So if you have any suspicion that this wound is beyond the limbus, please explore to make sure where is the end of the, of the wound. If you have a, a laceration like this from the cornea and angulating, so the priority always for the limbus. The limbus is the landmark. Then you go to the angles and then you continue your uh, stitches. If there is uveal tissue prolapse, you have to always replace the, the tissue and then put the suture and close it. The laceration can sometimes go underneath the muscle, so you might sometimes disinsert the muscle, stitch, the, the, uh, close the wound, and then you can reposition, reposit the, the, the muscle. If you have uh, um, iris, which is uh, outside, you can use viscoelastic technique. You just inject to, to uh, bring the iris back. Or you can use the cannula to sweep it in the anterior chamber back. Vitreous in the wound, these need to be excised. You can use the sponge or you can use a uh, vitrector to, to, to clean the area before uh, suture. Sometimes you can use cyclodialysis spatula to, to reposition a vitreous when it is uh, coming to, to the wound. Sometimes you are faced with anterior segment uh, intraocular from body. You have to suspect from body in all cases of trauma. Presence of from body in the anterior chamber can be very harmful to the, to the endothelium. And gonioscopy usually is avoided in an open globe injury. Uh, but in the OR, you can do a gentle gonioscopy to look to any foreign body which, which usually impacted in the inferior angle. Of course, dilated fundus exam is very important to rule out foreign body. If you cannot see anything and you have suspicion, you can do ultrasound or CT scan. MRI of course is, is contraindicated if you have any suspicion of metallic from body or unknown composition. From body in the eye, what it can do, it can cause a severe inflammatory reaction. One of the magnetic uh, from bodies is iron or steel. This can induce a very severe inflammatory reaction. Non-magnetic like copper or vegetable matters these are also can induce a very uh, severe inflammatory reaction. Mild inflammation, magnetic, nickel, non-magnetic, aluminium, mercury, zinc, these are a material which can induce a very mild inflammation, but it, it should be uh, removed. What about inert um, uh, material like glass? rubber, plastic, silver, and so on. These are materials which doesn't usually induce inflammation in the eye. As you know, presence of iron in the eye causes cirrhosis. Presence of copper in the eye causes chalcosis. And presence of organic matter can cause mycosis. What's mycosis? So during removal of foreign body from anterior chamber, you have always to constrict the pupil with mycone. Because during manipulation, the foreign body can go and touch the lens, can use cataract, or it can even go to the posterior chamber. So the, the um, foreign body can be used through the same wound, or you can open a limbal wound and grasp it and remove it, or you can use a magnetic uh, uh, magnet to remove the foreign body. There is two types of magnets, the earth magnet 
and the electromagnet, which is much more uh, stronger. What we uh, do if we have laceration and cataract? So laceration and traumatic and traumatic cataract. There is controversy regarding the timing of cataract surgery. In general, lens extraction should be post-bonded till the eye recover and the inflammation resolve. But there is some, some exceptions. If you have disrupted lens capsule and there is a lot of fluffy material in the anterior chamber and this can induce a lot of inflammation and raise and can raise interocular pressure, then you can do cataract surgery in the same setting. If you have a very opaque lens and you cannot examine the fundus, you cannot examine the retina, then in such a case you can um, remove the lens in the same setting. Pediatric patient, if you are, um, you don't want this to have to go to amblyopia because the, of the dense cataract, then you can remove it in the same setting. There is advantage for second setting. By, you know, postponing the cataract surgery, there is advantages. The, the important thing that you are controlling the inflammation before you do the surgery. You will have better media clarity. You will have a stable eye, stable wound. Um, and you can control the inflammation before, so the IOL implantation will be will associated with better outcome. And you can do a proper IOL calculation because you have time before the second procedure. So what is the factors associated with poor visual outcome after open injury? People who present with poor initial vision, hand motion or less, they have poor visual outcome later. People presented with blunt injury or a long wound, more than 10 millimeters, or involvement of zone three, or the presence of vitreous prolapse, vitreous hemorrhage, retinal detachment at presentation. All these factors indicate a poor prognostic factor after trauma. We published this paper in 2010 about prognostic factors after repair of open globe injury. You can look at uh, uh, these factors in details. So what is the take-home message? NLP at presentation does not by itself justify inclusion. So if you have patient with NLP presenting vision, repair the eye. Some of these patients, you will be surprised that they will have a bitter vision in the recovery period. And always be suspicious of any undiagnosed injury to other organs. So if you have an RTA with rupture globe, always think that this patient might have a multiple organ injury. Review the images yourself. Usually radiologist has limited experience with ocular injuries. So a patient who understands the severity of injury before you operate are less likely to blame or fault of a poor outcome. So always explain to the patient before you take them to the OR what is the circumstances of this injury? What is the severity of the injury? The goal is more than optimal treatment of injury. You are dealing with a person with a traumatized organ. When you deal with ocular trauma, you are not a tissue constructive specialist, but a physician. So we should explain to the patient. Um, usually these patients are in, in, يعني, in bad situation, emotionally, psychologically. So we should take the patient as, as a whole. Any questions?
No, at all. The main aim of primary repair is primary repair. Even cataract, there is counter repairs. So the main thing, close the eye. Watch for infection. Okay, and then refer the patient for retina. And even retina, they don't do it in acute setting. Usually, I, I remember that they do it two weeks after the, uh, the trauma, at least, when the eye is quieten. And also, this trauma usually induces, I think, vitreous uh, detachment, so it will be easier for them to be removed. Isn't it, Dr. Mohammed? Yes. Even the capsule is intact? Dr. Misfer? The later. Yes. Yeah. So the usually, it's your aim is primary repair. You don't go usually for cataract surgery unless you you have a very fluffy material and you know that next day you will have a very high IOP, very extensive inflammation, and the material, um, يعني fluffy material is in, in front of you, so you can just uh, remove it. Yes. Posterior rupture, if you have posterior rupture in acute setting, the acute setting we are closing the eye only. But you mean cataract surgery? Ah, through and through. What is the management? And you have an open eye? Close the anterior. Leave the posterior. It's not your business. Posterior is for the retina. If you would want to do it in the same setting, usually you take the IOL calculation from the other eye. So it will it is less optimum يعني, measurement. That's why it's better always to do it as a second setting. Close the eye. Examination does it in. Yeah, I agree with you. Any questions? Yes. What is the role of systemic antibiotics? Uh, we have another study about intravitreal injections. And we, these, you see this cases which has a risk factor, poor prognostic factor, these. Usually, we are running a study now in uh, university that patient who has had high risk of, of infection or poor vision, we give them intravitreal injection during the uh, primary repair. Uh, we give them vancomycin. And uh, there is one study shows that the risk of endophthalmitis is much, much less if you do this maneuver. But the role of systemic, um, it's controversial. Okay. Thank you.